are going to, to start this session. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to introduce a little bit myself and also the, the persons that are here in the this table. Uh, and then we can have 15 minutes each for, for presentation, short presentation, and then we will have 40 minutes, more or less, for discussion. Uh, my name is Carlos Garcia, I'm the dean of the, of the engineering school here in the Montreal University. Uh, I'm not really an expert in, in learning methods. I've worked a lot uh, in relationships with companies. Uh, and that's the reason, I, I, I suppose, I'm, I'm, not, I'm here now. Uh, for me, it's a very interesting, a very interesting session because we, we, are, we will have the occasion to talk about the relationship between university in engineering is very, very important, as you know, and the industrial needs. And for that, we have uh, three important persons with us coming from uh, three companies. Uh, first, we have uh, Miguel Encalvo coming from Morona. Here, we have Alex Tarcini coming from Matworks. And there, we have Xavier Fouget coming from the whole system. Uh, very important companies, not only because they are sponsors in this conference, but for the activities they, they develop every day, and also for the relationships they establish with universities, with engineering universities. So first, uh, Alex Tacini will, will give us a presentation. Alex Tarcini is business and market development. He works in business and market development in MathWorks from, from um, maybe 20 years ago. He started working in, in MathWorks. So, good. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, good morning. So this is actually the third conference day for me. It was very, very good so far, so I hope you have enjoyed it. And uh, I, I, I thank the organization of the conference for having invited us to uh, address you with this 15 minutes uh, introduction to model-based design. So this is going to be kind of tough. So this is going to be about uh, uh, design processes. And uh, uh, let me first of all share with you a few of the key ideas that we as MathWorks uh, uh, use to drive uh, our development and uh, the relationship that we establish with universities and, and research centers. Uh, the first one is that there are mecha-trends in the world that are going to influence uh, what universities teach their engineering students uh, and uh, how the relationship between the teachers and the learners are going to develop. Second one is that this is still on the agenda of the leaders at universities. How to attract students to math and technical staff, how to keep the students enrolled and engaged, and how to uh, train them in, in a way that they become employable, or if you want, in a way that they can uh, then create jobs rather than finding jobs. And last, we believe as networks that these two things, technical computing or computational thinking, if you want, and model-based design are uh, uh, kind of uh, tools, kind of tools that uh, universities can help to bring together innovation and uh, industry needs, teaching and uh, what the world actually needs. And in general, we believe that engineering uh, is a way that we can uh, improve the quality of life. So we, we feel like it's uh, kind of important to, to support this uh, uh, evolutionary process. So this is matters. Uh, we are about 3,000 people, and uh, in general, either students uh, use MATLAB during their engineering courses, or uh, 
they must make some intentional effort not to use it. So most of the control system design exams, uh, signal processing and image processing uh, exams, uh, embedded system, automation, well, uh, students are requested to solve something using MATLAB simulating or uh, any other uh, matters project. <laughs> Uh, this is why we believe we can tell you something useful about the relationship between university and industry. Because it's true that uh, we are quite prominent in education, but the reality is that every day, likely, you use or touch something that's been designed with MATLAB and Simulink, and probably has some code, some piece of an embedded system, that's been automatically generated with one of the matters tools. Now, uh, should this be a longer speech, I would probably try to address four mega trends that we see very important at the moment. We don't have time, so I will actually focus on uh, three, and actually I will speak to you about the first one. This idea that uh, software is going to be in everything. And uh, the idea is kind of uh, supported by uh, numbers and, and research. And I'm quite sure that most of you are familiar with these numbers. And this to me is uh, probably the most fascinating one. So 170 billion transistors per person in the world by now, at the moment. And you're probably all familiar with the Internet of Things concept and the fact that uh, things that you use on a daily basis talk to each other, create data, aliment in a way the big data or the data deluge phenomenon, and that we need tools and processes that uh, uh, allow us to process this information in a meaningful way. So, uh, this is uh, what a car looks like today. You know that there are several electronic control units or talking together, uh, working on a network. Most of the times a CAN network uh, on, on a car. And uh, each of these piece, each of the uh, embedded systems that control these car subsystems have software running. And the responsibility of the car makers is to ensure that all these pieces of software talk together in a consistent way uh, from very trivial things like sharing uh, the unit of measures that are used to exchange information to very complex ways. So ensure that uh, the algorithm that controls your anti-braking system or your stability program works correctly in all weather conditions. In general, automotive, uh, aerospace, uh, uh, telecommunication are all industries where development has been done with very traditional ways. And uh, uh, we have actually seen actual walls built inside organizations. So, uh, as you know, we say that inefficiencies stays on the borders in organizations. So it's when a department uh, having to uh, detail requirements uh, needs to speak with someone designing and implementing the requirements in an actual system. That's where the problems are. And apparently for years, companies have tried to make the problem even more, uh, even bigger, even more uh, visible. So that uh, requirements usually are captured in a paper form they are transmitted to people in an incomplete form. When it's time to uh, implement them and test the algorithms that uh, uh, allow a system to work in a, in a given way, well, uh, building physical prototype, it's a very time-consuming exercise, and most of the times it's very, very expensive. And, uh, well, when you come to coding, well, first of all, not all the companies that work in automotive have a long tradition of coding. They are more in the, to the thermodynamical uh, kind of systems, mechanical and all that. So coding can be a difficult exercise for them. But also, uh, manual coding is an exercise that introduces error. Error that if discovered when the product has been released, well, then can cost 
a lot of money to companies in terms of record program and things like that. So these are uh, some of the things that you have probably read in the news of automotive companies having to recall, for instance, millions of cars because of bugs found out in, uh, in, in cars. And they can just be, uh, you know, kind of fun, like you being locked inside a car and not finding a way to get out because the ECU have stopped working, or more serious problems that uh, are actually going to affect even what they are, what are called high integrity systems, so systems that uh, can, can put the life of human being at risk if they don't work in the right way. Uh, what we believe is a possible solution is the introduction of uh, modeling. And uh, I mean, as it is very traditional that if you design building, you will use building modeling tools. If you design a mechanical parts, there will be solid modeling tools. We believe that if you design systems that are going to run on embedded systems, so that are going to be transformed in a piece of software, you should use proper multi-domain system modeling tools. And that these systems can actively contribute to the quality of the products that we will deliver to the market. So if a system is made of several subsystems that you can look from several perspectives, the modeling and design tool that you use to model and simulate them will have to be able to represent all at once, all in the same environment, as, as much as it is possible, all with the same language and conventions, a continuous timepiece, a discrete timepiece, the finite element describing the logic, uh, uh, the physical modeling, and even what we call the text-based modeling. Also, close to the multi-domain system modeling tool that uh, engineers and designers do need, there is this idea that uh, development shouldn't be based on a traditional sequential step of actions taken by different departments but should be really integrated inside a process that we call model-based design. And uh, if you look at a typical description of the model-based design workshop, you see it happening inside a consistent environment, sharing the same language, where each phase happens at the same time with other design phase. And you move kind of seamlessly from uh, a research or a preliminary analysis phase to the development of models that represent as accurate as possible or as needed by the problem that we are trying to solve, the system that you are trying to control, and that at the end can automatically generate the code that's going to run on the embedded system, on the electronic control units, if you want. What happens is that the model, as we intend it, becomes actually the specification that is exchanged and becomes an executable specification. So that if you have to explain your colleague what the uh, door locking system of a car is supposed to do, instead of writing, uh, we would say, a, a nine years old child of, of paper describing in detail how the system should behave, you can give it a model that he will be able, he or she will be able to simulate and uh, visually understand how the system is supposed to be working and uh, where possible failures or emergency status might be. So this is a, a, a very industrial example. This is the, the vault. And uh, according to uh, General Motors, almost 1% of the code running in the vault subsystems have been generated automatically. And there are concerns that this might put job at risk. I mean, what will the programmers do when the code will be generated automatically by tools? But as a matter of fact, I mean, I'm in my fourth or fifth career at the Matworks, and the same is true probably for computer, computer IT specialists. They will have to turn themselves into managing tools that generate automatically code, rather than being the ones that really write the code itself. Okay, uh, we have, I believe, come rapidly 
to the end of, of this uh, segment. Uh, in general, let me just mention and tell you a few words about the other megatrends that you see. I have mentioned the Internet of Things. You know that there are now protocols that allow sensors, physical objects, to uh, exchange information in a consistent and kind of shareable way. Uh, we believe that not only that physical layer or first logical layer is important, but it's also important to uh, have tools that will allow uh, companies uh, to analyze the mass of data that's being produced and uh, get some sense out of it. Uh, in general, there's a lot of talking about the big data, or if you want the data deluge uh, thing in the press, that's not always a very good sign, but companies are becoming aware of the need of uh, having tools that can uh, meaningfully process and analyze the, the quantity of data that are going to be produced. This is kind of a, of a graph showing you how the connected things are going to grow in, in the next 10 years or so. And it, it's really dramatic. This is another trend that's very important to us. Uh, you know that you as university, uh, you are no longer the only information provider. Students come to you with a lot of concepts that have already been pre-activated. And this happens through non-formal, teaching agents, informal teaching agents. So there is a movement that's called the movement of makers. They gravitate around labs that they call themselves uh, fab labs, fabrication laboratories. Uh, places where people go and experiment with 3D printer, with low cost, or as I prefer to call, experimental hardware, like Arduino, Raspberry, and uh, Lego Mindstorm. This is an important trend for us. It goes together with other ways that uh, information are now distributed, like MOOC. I believe universities have to uh, understand exactly how to deal with these uh, non-university information providers, how to become knowledge managers rather than information managers, and how to actively and proactively use things like Arduino and Raspberry Pi to make what students do a bit more practical and also a bit more fun. I was in Orleans last week and it was very surprising. We ran a workshop, a hands-on workshop, where people can put their hands on hardware and then can try to create uh, simple systems. And uh, the, the, the happiest person in the class was a social science student who has never seen a line of code and had been able to light a LED on an Arduino board. And she was literally jumping on the chair. She was incredibly happy about it. And uh, I, I believe there is great potential in uh, all this stuff for uh, organized use by, by universities. And uh, it is our uh, job to try to make this thing as seamless and uh, effortless possible for people that do not have uh, an existing strong engineering background. All right, I uh, will stop here. I believe we are at the end of, of my segment. I'm not even going to uh, summarize the key ideas. Uh, we were discussing, we uh, expect you to have questions. And uh, if you will not have questions or curiosities, uh, as I told you, we will ask you questions. So it, it's better that you uh, get prepared to interact with us speakers in, in some way. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Alex, for this short but very interesting presentation, giving us some, some key message. I would like now to give the word to, to our next uh, uh, our next speaker, who is Xavier Fouge. Xavier is coming from, as I said, from the Soul Systems, France. He is a Global Academia Senior Director. Uh, and that's all. Merci beaucoup de venir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why is quiet?
the colleagues uh, pull up the presentation, I start telling you how happy I am to join your secret society of PBL. <laughs> uh, so I discovered you uh, in, well, Annette was my uh, initiator. She, she brought me into that society, Annette Colmos. And <clears throat> last time I had the pleasure to address you was in the opening, at the opening of the Arbok Center. In between, uh, I have uh, given uh, uh, testimonials of my adherence to your movement by pushing our public uh, uh, relation group to, to write an article in our corporate magazine about PBL. This magazine is outside, you can take it. There is an interview of Annette in it. <coughs> so it's, it's compliant to the religion. I, I made sure she polices our journalists. So, page 36 in the magazine, you can find out some. <laughs> uh, I, it's an easy transition after Alex for me to, to start this presentation because we, we cover about the same segment, but uh, looking at a very, very uh, physical part of what engineers do. Uh, software is getting to be everywhere, but this everywhere still needs to be engineered in conjunction with the software. Understanding how these two things will in interact, this is what we want to do. Uh, we see ourselves as a scientific company. The purpose of the company is very basic. We want to simulate everything. It's uh, ambitious, but we want to simulate everything, including life, including uh, things that are not traditionally, uh, I would say, manufacturing oriented. Uh, that means that we, we, we try not just to put some programs on algorithms, we also try to put some algorithms on realities that have not yet been conceptualized into models. There are good examples, for instance, in life sciences where there is still a huge work to do in creating models of what happens in nature. Uh, the company is quite large. We are the first French software company operating worldwide, uh, about 3 billion uh, turnover. Customers in all industries, this is just a sample uh, to tell you the, especially the, the typical domains where, uh, oops, typical domains where this software will be used in, in, in this uh, segment of the industry. If you would have asked me to, 10 years ago, who is the largest customer of the company? It would be a Boeing, for instance, or a Toyota. Today, it's a Procter & Gamble. So these type of techniques that consist in creating product, uh, computer models of things that will exist, whatever these things are is spreading from traditional manufacturing industries to everything. And these computer models are the language of engineers. This is how people who invent new things interact together. So if we teach bad English to our engineers, we should also teach them to model in a computer uh, what they think about in terms of new products. In terms of education, this is uh, what is driving us. We see two very large uh, megatrend, to use the same words as Alex, but megatrend in education, not, not in industry. Uh, but that has to reflect what happens in industry. One thing is interdisciplinary collaboration, the capability in a new graduate to combine different disciplines. And here, that's the very reason why we are attracted by PBL, because PBL is a good way to force the combination of different types of knowledge into one intellectual and constructive exercise. Uh, second driver we have is the uh, collaboration at a distance, because 
We do believe with uh, connectivity that not only things will be connected, but also brains. Well, this is also what's already the case. If you look at this airplane here, the 787, this was engineered by people dispersed in 30 different countries. Not waking up at the same time, not speaking the same language, all speaking bad English, except maybe the native English speakers. So they need tools because at the end this airplane must fly, so the ideas of yesterday evening must be clearly transmitted to the next engineers in the next time zone. Are we teaching these practices? We don't think it's yet at the point it should be, and we try through our work to encourage universities and to facilitate their adoption of these methods in terms of how they teach. We do that in a four steps pro process, starting with an educational research we conduct together with universities on uh, uh, educational practices that take benefit of digital tools. This, is a, this can be funded by us or it can be funded by, and that's the, 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 the case, the, the most frequent case, by uh, research projects. So we go together after research grants with universities, always as a supply. I will give you an example afterwards. Then we transfer all results of this activity to all of the users of one or the other of one of our technologies, which by the way, uh, I did not mention, but are these ones here, among which uh, uh, you may know Katia or you may know SolidWorks. If you are, uh, these are things that are very different from uh, 3D design. These are things that relate to uh, social networks, that relate to search engines in large data, because these are tools that will increasingly be engineering tools. Not, engineers will not use only design tools. They will have to navigate into massive sets of ideas that are available either on the internet or uh, in their private databases. How to navigate in a creative manner into this ocean of knowledge and extract things that are relevant to what I, engineer, try to invent or the problem I try to solve. We transfer this content also through projects that we conduct together with institutions and when we work at, 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 a, uh, at the level of a region or at the level of a country, uh, then we assemble all these tools that result from our activity into programs, na nationwide programs. We do that in four fields, digital learning practices, how to bring digital tools into a business that is called education. And then we will see MOOC, then we will see uh, inverted or a flipped classroom, then we will see the application of the Internet of Things to uh, remote virtual labs, etc. We try to accelerate professional practices, practices that have emerged in industry, to, to accelerate the transfer of those practices into the curriculum. It's not easy. If you are in a university, teaching the engineering principles is easy because they are very stable, but teaching the engineering practices is difficult because they are moving every day. And the place where they are moving is usually in businesses. And the time it takes for the curriculum to absorb a, a new practice that has emerged from business may be very long. I could give you dramatic examples. The next uh, field of activity is to promote interdisciplinary collaboration, the combination of different disciplines, because when you have a computer model that represents the many facets of a real problem, not just one facet, then you force people to think about how the different disciplines interact with each other. And here we hit the traditional world in, in uh, academia of uh, specialization of the different educators. It's a world. It's, it's two zillion years of tradition. And then uh, we, we, the last focus is international collaboration. 
I told you the, the, this is an increasingly important manner of collectively inventing new products across cultures, across distance, across countries, across time zones. And this has impacts on the organizational aspect of the daily life of an engineer. Question, are we teaching these practices? Not really, what we try to do is to help universities do that, and we do this from kindergarten or post-kindergarten to uh, PhD. Here are a few examples of uh, such uh, educational innovations that we uh, provide in a documented manner. If I drill down a little bit in those, here are a few examples that are illustrated using 3D in educational material, especially in MOOCs, because MOOCs uh, have shown how uh, small the retention rate is, people who go through the full cycle, because a lack of uh, interactivity, because it's not engaging. Put 3D in a MOOC, you will increase the level of engagement. It's very easy. It's, it, any professor can do that. It's not for specialists. So this is something that we have started to uh, prove through examples we provide to anyone. Uh, one application of it uh, being to extend textbooks with online 3D content. Instead of just putting printed pictures in a textbook, you would associate to each page uh, 3D content that is uh, served somewhere browsable from any type of uh, terminal. This is a project we conduct it with uh, students in France in secondary education uh, and with the Hachette publisher. Everything that you do in a lab can be modeled. Everything can be simulated. What you see here each time is an exercise in the reality taken as a video and on the left uh, you see the corresponding exercise virtualized. So if you can create computer models that behave exactly like the, the equipment you have in your labs, you can start thinking about flipping the lab, not just the classroom. <coughs> I'm not saying replacing, I'm saying flipping. There are many reasons why we do not want to replace it, but there are many more reasons reasons why we want to extend the opportunity for students to access existing material in your lab before going into the lab by using the virtual avatars uh, of this equipment. So and with that already you can start thinking about tons of changes in the way you organize the access to your labs. This is cool because it's not just having a, a a copy of the equipment into a computer. It's also about operating this equipment at a distance. In, in the case illustrated here, the, the, the computer was in Pune in India, and the robot that was driven by the computer was in Paris, and here we had a webcam, a webcam sending back the image of what really happened in, on the physical robot. So this type of scenario can be extended to very diverse tools at any distance. And then here again, you can start thinking about involving in your activities uh, students that are remote, accessing your labs, or vice versa. Uh, several projects right now are starting with this technology where universities in advanced countries want to open their labs to uh, developing countries. Uh, here is another type of project that I, I, I like to uh, mention. It's a set of a dozen of universities yearly from September to January. Groups of students in these universities work together on a distributed model of uh, something they have to create. Year, the two first years, they had to do that on the factory. This year, they have included uh, two universities of agriculture, so they can 
and the subject is a digital farm. So they are trying to solve a, a problem that relates to precision agriculture uh, by mixing teams of mechanical, electronic, uh, and agricultural engineers that are dispersed in countries from Peru to China, including Europe, Africa, and South America. I mentioned the possibility to, uh, from the, the tool we have, the practice we have to work together with universities in going after grants. This is an example of a project that is funded by the French research agency, uh, in which we went together with a school called uh, uh, Supmeca in Paris. This is a four million euro grant about developing a curriculum totally based on case studies for systems engineering. This has been extended just recently into a European project. Now they are looking for European partners to join that project of the, the Erasmus Plus program. The last example I want to share with you is, I, I, I know uh, my friend uh, Eric, Eric de Graff will smile, he smiley, because he likes, or he, he smiles after this notion of flipping the capstone. The same way we flip the class, same way we flip the lab, we, we try to flip the end of study project and making that an exercise that students perform at the beginning of their studies. To experience collaborative activities, to experience problem solving, right the first or second week of uh, their presence at university by combining different activities into a single predefined exercise that will bring them into different disciplines using tools that will give them a glimpse of what they will discover at university. So it's a two weeks program, for instance, you can implement it in different lengths. In two weeks, you will then, at the end, tell them, Tuesday afternoon, the role you had was the role of a purchase engineer. So they start realizing what are the different specialties in the engineering profession, which they do not know when they arrive, the first year students. Or you can tell them on Thursday morning, what we did is something we call finite element modeling. Finite element is something difficult and boring that they will discover in semester three or four or whatever. You announce the different courses they will be able to take, but they will have had through that exercise uh, an opportunity to put in context these disciplines. I, I skip a few others. Just one word about this one. The tools that were, I was mentioning are tools in which you, you will be at a distance collaboratively defined objects, systems, solutions to problems. But you know better than, than me, you know that this exercise requires interactions that are also of social nature. This requires creativity, solution finding. So what we can do today is, is also to provide not just a space for collaboration in which they will share the representation of their ideas, but also a space for guidance where background information is provided by the educators and a space of inspiration where they will have access to uh, specific tools to the World Wide Web about the subject that is interesting to them, the problem they are trying to solve, as it was discussed yesterday evening, not two weeks ago. It's instant indexing of relevant subjects. So they will find ideas about uh, putting prothesis on a duck, if that's the issue. Who did that yesterday evening? Up to yesterday evening. And that's the way more and more the industry is working also, not just by themselves inventing, but inventing in the context of the global brain. Thank you. Thank you, Xavier. Merci beaucoup. And for, for this also very interesting presentation. And this is time now for, for Miguel and Cabo. Miguel and Cabo 
is coming from Orona. He is the Corporate Director of Technology, R&D and Information Technologies in Orona. And uh, he's going to explain us the, the ecosystem of innovation they have developed in this company. So, yeah. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you very much to the Congress to invite me and Orona. It's very special to Orona to be here and also uh, adapting this new installation, Rona Foundation is the building to support the Congress. And the presentation for me is to introduce to Rona. Rona is a young company. Yeah? It's, uh, we are a 50 years old company, but we think we are young. And also it's important in Rona the strategic, the strategic uh, point of view of the technology, the, the, the role of technology in, in in Orona is a key factor for strategy. And we talk about the technology, we talk about engineering. We talk engineering, we talk about people. We talk about people, we need people. If we need people, we need the collaboration with the university. But we work with the university, we want to support how the university can uh, grow and connect to the company. No? This is what I'm trying to summarize the presentation. Ah, well, Orona, eh? we are in, just say, a local global company. Eh? We are local, the origin is very, very local. Eh? We started 50 years ago in a factory, close from here, 5 kilometers from here, producing leaves, which are oriented to produce with the factory, with the industry. And more and more, Orona is growing, this strategy. And in the last period, in the last uh, 20 years, Corona World also have a spectacular growth uh, in this uh, in this position. No? Now we are in we are more than 4,500 4, people. We are focused in Europe, but very present in all the world. Eh? More than 100 years, 100 countries. Well, this is good, but we are in a sector. In a uh, global sector, with the, our competitors are huge from comparing with us. Uh, we are 25 times bigger than Orona, and these competitors are global and have uh, a lot of uh, resources, and they use the technology as a resource in the strategy. No? And that is a problem for Orona, how to answer to that because we don't have the enough, enough resources, we don't have the enough knowledge, we don't have the enough, a lot of things we don't have, no? And, and this is the question, no? To, in our model, in our hope to answer to this situation, we must to innovate. Okay? We won't have the same, the same role, the same materials, no? Well, in the last 20 years, Rona focus in the technology, and it is very uh, impressive growing in the effort that Rona put in R&D. But if we add the effort in this last 20 years, he compared it with one competitor, for instance, Kone, as we said the same, eh? Rona put in, in the effort in 20 years, the same effort that in one year, one of the competitors put in, you know, the very dramatic position, no? And we talk about David against Goliath. You know we're going, no? Well, what is the four key factors to answer in the technological uh, innovation model? Well, commitment, yeah? it's very clear. When we talk about relation with Orona, the university, other partners, the commitment oriented to the same goal. Open network and organization, we talk, it's very useful to talk, PDL, PDL is, is the base of the company. We are, that's 20 years ago, we are in PDL process. We need to collaborate, we have to share information, we need to, to manage, we have to communicate, we are going to do the same results, we have to share. No? Technology, also important to answer, and the most important, we need to resolve. Or in the two results, eh? technology, knowledge, people are very important, but finally, we have results. 
some something in the chain is not good. No? This word or the well commitment is the key point eh? to to orient it. If you are in the if the company has a problem or has a need, it's very important that this need, this problem might be to understand with the partners or eh? well more than 15 years ago or in this uh, in this situation when we check the competitors and the market realize that we need to survive, we need to change. Eh? This is one of the origin of, of, of this point. Uh, we need to reconfigure the model of Corona. We need to promote the technology because technology in this sector has a, 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 key, fo a, a key factor. We need to be the, uh, no dependent. Technology is very important uh, to be compete, to be no dependent and to be close to, to the leader and close to the market, no? this is. For that, Corona must invest. Uh, this is the first thing we need to answer, put resources uh, to, give, uh, to invest and to compromise, not for one year, you know, to long term at this activity. Uh, and for that, we establish a relationship with university, with research centers, because the Orona resources are not enough. For no view of volume, and also for no view on, on, on the rapidity we need to answer to, to the needs. Well, what is the summarizing the study vision of Orona? Today, is represented in this figure. We are five strategic pillars, one international, international talk about growing, we are very small. Uh, we are not uh, the, the. We consider we are not. Uh, Orona is a big company, and we taking in the local. In Hernani is uh, the most important company, also in the past country, maybe in Spain. But when you take around the world, we are nothing. No, nothing. If you uh, comparing with competitors, no, at international is very important. No, not only growing, also to diversify, and also to be. In the real, in the real commitment with the competitors, no. The second one, service, when service. Uh, explain, no. The original Rona is an industry company, no. We need to produce leads, produce uh, products, but when you check the the business activity, this is important. This continue to be very important, but when you view profitability, is not enough. Eh? Before that, Rona is moving in his portfolio of business more and more to the service business and to be a service company is also a challenge and we want to transform it a lot of things culture capacities etc competitiveness is uh, summarize the need when we orient it to the future and uh, we need to invest you need to grow to invest uh, at current companies you must invest in r d we need resources to do it continuously, not only one year, two years, three years, the activity might be competitive. If not, it's not sustainable. So that is a real commitment with the competitiveness. And this factor is one of the key points of the result we ask for the technology. The for one technology, in this sector, technology represents a, a gap against competitors. Yeah? Leaves, if you don't uh, know what is the technology in the leaf, it's real. You consider it's a traditional product, electromechanical product. But uh, this is real, this is uh, 20 years ago, it's like that. But in the last 20 years, uh, these big competitors changed completely the, the product or the concept of the, of the business, introduced a lot of technology. On the embedded system control the elevator. One elevator today has more than uh, 50 CPUs in controlling all the all the movements of the of the components, and this is why Corona need, have this this problem or have to need to, to solve this 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 gap. Ah, in the middle, developing model to talk about people. Eh? Corona, I don't. Explain all this to Orona. Orona is a cooperative, 
no? uh, but also especially in this case, or main goal, like cooperative, is to, to develop people, to create, to create and generate uh, the business and, and employ. And for to that, organization, model of this organization, developing of the people, training of the people, is nuclear also. And so that is in the middle of this strategy. <coughs> well, the mission of OTAD is to answer to this question. In the complex chain, eh, the, the value chain of Orona, but in the R&D, the production, the service business, we have a lot of, of uh, opportunities to, to improve and to be close of these leaders in, in the in sector, we are ready to, to follow this, this and, 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 and control the, the gap we have um, oriented to the results. No? Technology, to do that, we are not innovate, eh? we are uh, based on, on tools, I think very popular, but maybe the, the difference with uh, using the tool is why Orona is using this tool. No? I think it's very simple to, to present you. No? We're trying to, to orient it to the future, to anticipate, and to have questions. Yeah? Because to innovate, to collaborate, the important is to have questions. Maybe you can all the answers we want, but uh, the important is to, to promote questions. No? And, and, this, and this question, well, regarding the future, Regarding the market, the competitors, the trends of the future, regarding also with our capacities and with who have these capacities and how to improve that, and finally to the push pull between the market and, and the technology. No? For do that, maybe the specialist, the PPL system of Corona to do that. No? The specialist to do that is Corona. Integrating this process, the company, the university, the research center, and to give a special, a special um, key factor success. No, so that is very complex because we must integrate different culture, different uh, 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 oriented. Uh, people want to relate to the same goal is 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 quite difficult to put in, in order all these these questions and we must to be very open to do that because you want to share the most strategic information you have in the company and you must to believe uh, that this is uh, important no? and this is complex at the beginning it's not easy to do that no? well finally i think the result is we oriented company, the needs of the company, with the capacity we have, with the strategy also of the university or the social center and put in the same in the same direction. I think this is uh, one of, of the results that is very important to adapt. And with that we try to, to answer to the main question, no? to have the results. Because when Orona put uh, live in the market, the, for instance, in Europe, not in here in Nagani, where Orona is well known, no? we put in Paris. The first thing is, uh, the first colonies Orona is don't know in Paris. With Orona, what is Orona? I said, uh, no, the first thing is Orona is don't know. People who are very new in this place, uh, well, the, the only way to put in the market one product is, the, is to be the most competitive option. It's, it's so simple, but it's so true. Before that, competitiveness in the innovation is the key factor. But finally, we do, we do a lot of things in the R&D process, to investigate, to research, to, uh, to check uh, the trends, uh, to develop projects, uh, to put pro products in, in the market. But finally, it's important to end it what it competitiveness and summarize we must to be close to the market needs. We must to be not dependent on technology because it's easy to have problems with, uh, with the property of the, of the technology and finally, finally cost effective. 
well, organization or, or network uh, in Roma, well, also Roma yeah, technology area who are responsible in Roma is integrated in the board of directors at the first level, that it is very important. If uh, Orona has a commitment with uh, technology, it must be also protagonist in the first level of the strategy. And after that, Orona, um, we need or we have uh, distributed uh, teams. Yeah? We have two factories, one in Hernani, other in Vitoria. We create a corporate center, Orona IAC, to manage um, support the, the technology and we uh, introduce in this in this uh, in this net our partners the university and the research center no? who have some capacities eh, facilities eh, it's important in our to have the facility we are going but uh, we started no so so long in this uh, in this project but we are more and more uh, increasing these capacities and Orna IDEO represents one of the challenges Orona uh, developed. No? Orona trying to put in the same place, in the same space, the company, the research, and the university. No? And this is a figure who is distributed Orona IDEO. Maybe you are enjoying this uh, during this day, uh, nice buildings and the nice place we are uh, developing yes it's true we try to put something something special and uh, in this space we put the company the Rona Zero present the corporate building of Rona we manage uh, the factory close to that the technology center we put the technology and in the same place uh, the university and not also the university point of view to collaborate in R&D University oriented to the people, eh? to, because Corona, this project needs, if we grow, we need people, and this process needs of people. No? Well, when we share in this model uh, three, three mainly actors, we're trying to answer to these questions, no? <coughs> to have the same strategy in technology, we have oriented the, the different lines of the, of the university and the company in the same direction. We have put together human resources and we must try to be very efficient in, in point of view of the economical investment. No? This is what the key factors. We try and we are into the future to open. Eh? This uh, local network must be going. We have some some experience but we think is in we starting we need more time to, to go in because it's true the gaps in technology we must to solve integrating other capacity not trying to develop it by own capacity because it's not so 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 quick to the market no so that integrating the other capacity is, is one of the key of this of this model to manage this ecosystem will have a, a cycle eh? for four years. Cycle uh, we started in 2000. Is the four times we renovate the cycle. The main is to ask for four years uh, the run strategy eh? of the company things um, trying to be important for the future. And after that, to put different committees. Eh? In, in the red color, you can see the city. The city is the, the general meeting of technology in Orona. Every six months, eh, we put together the Orona company with the university, with the research center, and we share in, in one journey all the, the information, the important information. And all it is a process to, to share information. Is a process to combine, to be close, to orient to the same. To TPBL must be also uh, is a key factor to have the same the same goal in our team. 
to be independent, to be a different company, to be a different reality in each day, you know? that is important. And after this general meeting, we celebrate uh, two years ago, 25 times we are doing that. It's, it's, it's important no? to, to have this uh, consistency in, in the time. Uh, well, the rest is a bit usual, no? the committee is to, to manage the project, to manage the budget, to manage the, the, the results, so the, etc. Et and finally, well, to manage the, in, in the R&D, in this portfolio, yeah, we promote in, in for four years. We must to have a planning of project. In this project, you we introduce the different things, the perspectives, the generation of ideas, the good ideas, because we need good ideas, but ideas is easy to, to manage. We need to improve the alliance or to how to solve the gaps <laughs> we identify in our capacities. But the financial also, yeah. You have, uh, we must be very efficient because we have the, the same resources of competitors. We must be very efficient in this, in this process. It's very important, etc. No? And well, this is the presentation for today. Corona, junto llegamos a más. Carrequín, eh? Runaco. Touching Father Together is one of the, the base of Corona and also represents what's the, in the in this ecosystem of innovation or on a try to, to develop. Thank you very much. Hello, yeah. my name is Peter de Vries, I'm from the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. I have a question about companies and universities, because universities tend to deliver students and companies tell they're not skilled enough. And what I see happening here is that companies change rapidly. Universities do not change that rapidly. So what do the companies expect from universities? Or maybe better, could they describe what kind of a university they, they would like to have? Excellent question. Uh, I have my Is that working? Is this working? Censorship! <laughs> now, I like this question because I have, I'm dreaming about that for years. To specify the university, that's the way I would like to have it. Uh, a few attributes of the ideal universities in my eyes would be an institution that, number one, trains their employ employees. Continuing education of educators. <coughs> this is not a rule. It's a rule in many private businesses. It's a law in some countries for private businesses to spend some money and the percentage of working time for training the employees. So number one, when you speak about continuing education, you usually think about giving education, not receiving education. Number two, a place where there are incentives to accelerate the change process. Changing the curriculum, adapting the curriculum, uh, is an exercise that may take several years in, in tra traditional institutions. Uh, in several years, you, you may 
you may be uh, creating catastrophes in industry if you take that speed. So, governance processes that enable curriculum change uh, within the, the year, for the next year. If you take these two, you already can make the revolution in many institutions. So I will not add other ones, but I wish my colleagues share their dreams. Well, I think in the, in the question is the answer. No? So, hey, uh, companies, society, the life of us to that, because a lot of changes around us, mandatory to that. And it's true in the university in general, uh, this process is by slow dynamic. No? And now we ask for the for the university to adapt to that. Uh, we are to innovate also in the, in the answer, uh, the objective to how to to be attractive to people, not to young people to study. It's quite complex. And how these people finally uh, are oriented to the society or the company so is also no, a key factor. And if we are in a process with a lot of changes in around the uh, university must to think in that no? and uh, all we ask to, to the university is to adapt to that. Because in the company every day we must to adapt. The changes are very fast. Yeah? We are, must to change the strategy, must to, to answer, must be flexible. Uh, maybe this two questions. Flexibility uh, to adapt, I think is not the strong point in general in Europe or in Spain in the North. Okay, so let me let me add something to that. Uh, recruitment processes in private companies can be exhausting. And uh, despite running candidates through maybe five, six, seven interviews in a row, companies or at least networks still make uh, mistakes uh, with this meaning that we still hire people just to realize that there is a mismatch between the person's aspirations and what the company like matters needs. So I believe companies at times have unrealistic expectations so we want to hire people that can uh, you know, eat fire, so not, not smell of gasoline, that, that's kind of a, not, not, not possible. But still I believe that universities could help companies and employers by clarifying with students what they really intend to do. And I believe there might be a first very big category. Do you want to work with people? Do you want to because if you want to really be an engineer and build something and you end up in uh, managing a team of people and having to pay attention to feelings and things like that, probably that's a big mismatch. And uh, you will end up not being happy about what you do. And at the end, you will uh, switch to a, a different job. And this will be a big loss for the company that has hired you. So I believe uh, one desire I would have, work with your students, clarify their minds about what they really intend to do in their life. Because that's going to be a first important direction that they will have to take. So it's uh, most of times people of things, and then there will be a few exceptional individuals that are able to conjugate these two things together and be good at designing things and uh, working with with other people. <coughs> it's uh, I'm Bettina Dajsonova from Aalborg University. It's a question I, I saw on the slides from the Arona presentation, something about that you work in project teams. And I wonder because what we do at Aalborg and many places here is we work, the students actually work in problem-based projects. And then I was wondering how, how do you see I mean, how, how do you actually work? I mean, not, it's not, not just a question for you, it's maybe all of you, all three. How, how do you, in the real life, work in project teams? How, and how do you, do you see that kind of 
fitting with PBL, problem-based learning, or can we learn something both ways maybe? And yeah, again, is it relevant for you that our students come with all of that? It's related to what you were just saying in the middle, that they come with this experience working in projects. That's what we're hearing. So, thank you. We invest uh, in this question a lot of, of uh, time, no? to, to time for practice and connected uh, the student to their, to their company is the key factor. No? How we do that and with experience? I think experience starting with uh, sharing, uh, study and work. In, in the Mount Dragon University, um, I mean, this is one of the key factors, not today, no? 20 years ago when I was also teacher, student, and worker, uh, I think it's based of all the experience we have. This is, it gives a lot of things, this process. We connect, we connect to reality, we give some values in, in this process, because we need to be commitment, we have to effort, we have to, to manage the studies and, and the work. We are more connected in this process. I think with the experience we have in this last 25 years and all of the people from come with this model, I think we are very, very proud of that. And maybe because it gives a real result. No? After that, in 20 years ago, maybe the, 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 the people, the students, need to work because to support economic health and studies is very important. Today, it's not. It's not the same situation, uh, they change uh, a lot of things, and also now the people, it changes, you know? the society is different. No? And now the question is, to support this process, we must, we must be attractive. It's not enough to pay to a student to work some hours in the company, in an apartment with, with uh, working and experience and some money at the end of the month, it's not enough. We must be attractive. Must to, uh, and this is a, a question that I think we have not all the answer to do that, no? because to be attractive is a is place also where the young people today think is attractive. Mm -hmm. Good question, no? Is the relation, is the, the ambience, is the configuration? Is there freedom in some no? But uh, for a model, I think is is the key factor, no? And we invest in that, and we try to also to influence it in the in the procurement process to do that, no? Yeah. The, the, the reason I was an engineer anymore we working in isolation. It's, well, you may find some stars, but that's the exception. It's not the big number you are looking at. So the uh, team skills are skills. So that definitely something uh, that students should learn. It's not high school that will tell them. So it's your programs. It's good for you so to reflect them when you provide them with exercises, these team-based exercises, about what happens, because no one tells them what happens in the team interaction. The, uh, I, I was, uh, uh, my office in, in our company is at the place where we do train our personal, our colleagues. So uh, every day I see the list of courses that are ongoing for uh, our colleagues and, and for me also. And one of them is, uh, I, I just uh, took a picture of that when I passed by. It was uh, keeping the team efficient in, in stress situations. So it's the, we, we, we need to do that because Performance is there. It's in the way the team interacts. The more you teach them about it, the better it is. The more you give them opportunities to put the finger on how a team works, the better it is.
Yes, let, let me try to add something to that. Well, uh, development organizations are kind of leaving PBL places, right? That does not mean that uh, we comply with, with a set of rules that uh, Annette would recognize as best PBL practices. Uh, in general, uh, when, when, a, when a new person joins the teams, uh, it's usually given a set of rules that should uh, allow him or her to become a good corporate citizen. What I see missing is uh, um, something about how communication happens inside uh, a, a company. And the fact that uh, whenever you are exchanging information or you are receiving information, you might be in uh, several different relationships. You might be someone who's just informed of what's happening, someone who's being consulted about what's going on, or something that actually will be one of the negotiators that will make things happen. So assume that no one will tell you that team working is not important. It, it would just be probably unconceivable to say something like that. Still, I believe that some of the people that we uh, receive are missing this basic understanding of what makes uh, an employee a good citizen of the corporate that he's going to work in. And then there is all the PPL thing, because we are all in making things, and so we are in dealing with real-life problems in a way. Uh, and you can uh, adhere to the agile development uh, style of doing things. There are, there are several nuances of, of what PBL. There is the cooperative learning kind of environments. But really communication is probably one of the basic things that we would like to see uh, kind of work done or, or improved on, on people. Is this on? Okay. Um, yeah, how do I put it? Maybe I feel right now there is too much we and you. That you as consumers of our graduates and us as the universities that have so many difficulties in changing. And I think we need to overcome the us and you. I think we simply need to start creating a totally new uh, way of, of interacting in education. Otherwise, we will never get there. Because companies can ask for new uh, competences and have to put in employability and we need to train our staff and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But I think the most efficient way of actually training, and this is what active learning tells us, it is to do things together. And in that sense, it is problem-based and product-based learning. It's also to open up the door to society outside. And it's actually to invite you in uh, from the company side. So our students do something together with you. And how can we facilitate that process much more? Because I think this is the way to go. I think that you, get, you gain something from, from the students and they learn something and we gain something. So it's, it's, we need to think in some new concepts. Um, I'm just trying to provoke a little bit. <laughs> we need you to help educating. So. The day when we finish to use the uh, we and you, maybe we solve all the problems. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's true. Uh, traditionally, it's, 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 it's that, not this one of the question. To be close, to be in the same commitment. Uh, the company, city, university, well, and it's difficult because the interests of each part, maybe is, in some cases, are not the same. We are not at the same time. Uh, companies think traditional, we can put. Uh, something which happens now, go to university and ask to the university, give me people well formed, well with, with well, good knowledge, with new capacities, uh, we adapt it and we're possible, no? we are stuck. Well, it's 
is a question on your thing, no? I do that every day. I do that. Uh, only in, I think it's one of the 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 main the main problem we we try, no? But you real with the comp what the company do? Or what is the commitment of the company with the university? Uh, solving it is public or private? I think that is not uh, the question, no? Well, and in this question, uh, companies have some 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 uh, they must do a lot of things with the don we think in the in the result but we don't think in the origin of the problem no? how the company can help the university to be more attractive to young people in general no? we can help that we need to help that we have to, to to promote that and I think the university needs the support it's not enough uh, I think uh, Always when you talk is opponent with both parties think can solve the problem independently. It's not no. But I think it's a commitment of to to do that. And it's true the dynamic of the company sometimes is not adapted to the dynamics of the university. No? I think both must be to to be a process to to move in both directions. No? But it's uh, I think when I don't know. Yeah. We provoke, but I also I provoke. No, you have a question. I think he's talking, continues talking about that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my name is Mona Lisa Downs from Workbook University. Seems that all the speakers are <laughs> from Workbook University. Sorry about that. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for three very interesting presentations. And then I would like to maybe return a bit back to the first question which was raised here. Uh, because much as I agree with what Annette just said about the collaboration between industry and universities, are industry and universities the only stakeholders in higher education? I heard Alex talk about universities must match the industry needs. I heard Charlotte talk about a business called education. Just one week ago, I was in a teacher training workshop uh, on board a two-masted schooner somewhere out in the North Atlantic, and we were just discussing sustainability, especially in the Baltic region. So we were like 30 teachers from 14 different countries, all very, very concerned about sustainability, about environmental uh, issues, climate change, pollution of the Baltic Sea, etc., etc., we were very concerned about rising inequality between rich and poor, both within countries and between countries. We were extremely concerned about high, high levels of unemployment, especially among young people, etc., etc. So we were discussing the question, which I now want to pose to you, because we did not have any industry representatives in our group. The question we were discussing is, what's the purpose of higher education? Now I would like to hear the point of view from industry on this question. Thank you very much. chain between the university and, and the company maybe is very short. You must to extend the, the chain no? and go up to the high school and uh, behind this high school, no? at, at the families, uh, at home, what's happening about, about people, about because at the end, this is the, the fact. Uh, we don't we analyze the result at the end of the chain, the building, the result is the people are well formed at the, at the school or are, are well connected to the companies or if the companies have the enough uh, uh, capacity of people when, at this the end of the process no I think it was to to uh, to, to influence in all and when we talk in all I think we talk about all the things no the political the society economical because it's not the same situation in a in the 
depending on the economic situation of, of the society. No, these things I think are are on the on the, on the table. No, the question I think and now I think in, 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 in all the world that we are now thinking about that. No? Because the effect of things that happen in in affect. Uh, we don't think uh, trying to solve in our in one part of the chain trying to solve this, this question is not enough. But I think again must be what is the, the key factor, the commitment of all in this process. Starting for our capacities. Yeah? If the company can do things to try to improve that, we think yes. Also the diversity, also the politician, also in our houses with our children, all must be in this. It, uh, it is it's, uh, simple to, to say the problem is others have the problem. I have also, you know, it's not, it's not easy to that. No? But finally, it's very complex. So, sorry, have it's only because I'm very brave that I have tried to answer the question. Uh, so I believe higher education, my hope is that you and us and uh, whoever we might consider a, an agent of, of education can uh, train, create, form students able to deal with complex issues and situation and able of uh, thinking at a higher level of abstraction. This doesn't tell anything about what these people should really look like, but this is in general the expectation, this is why we define that higher education rather than uh, education. Now, uh, w one of the issues, going back to uh, Annette's point earlier, is that one size does not fit all. This is true for people, this is true for education systems, universities, but it's also true for companies. So the ability of a small or middle enterprise to really dedicate time, resource, energy and effort to create a relationship with a university, to uh, have uh, guest students that need to be managed. The, the ability of these organizations is, is very limited and uh, they have also very limited ability to deal with uncertain outcome of the investments they make. And unfortunately, the investments in education are still uncertain outcome and probably they have to stay like this. I mean, we do all we can to get to a certain point but it's very difficult to go from A to B with a straight line. We don't know exactly what the outcome will be in six months' time. Or very often it is like that. So uh, that's what we expect. People able to take the problems at a higher level of abstraction, thinking not only to their immediate return, but thinking of something that's good for the world in a very general or if you want abstract way. And also we should take into the pictures smaller size organizations, smaller size uh, also come to systems and universities because they play an important role in, in, in all this. Thanks very yeah. much. Yes. I'm sorry, we, have, we don't have many time, but we have also one, we have two more questions. So. Uh, your question was so shocking, I need to rest a little bit before I try taking the microphone. It was shocking because it's uh, unusual and it's, uh, I think, we should imagine the world without higher education. First, you will not be here, I will not be here, we will not be talking together in our bad English because we learned that at university and we would sit in the, in the air because no one would have built this building. You will not hear me, there would be no microphone. I'm talking about engineering education. So it's the same, the question is the same as if you would ask uh, what about uh, what the purpose of society, what the purpose is. So it's, it's, we could probably write books about that. Uh, 
but I don't think uh, corporate is the voice that should give you that answer. It's, it's a social issue more general than the one that concerns businesses. So it's, it's easier to, to, to look at your question from the angle that and my brought, uh, Annette brought, uh, of uh, what kind of fusion, what kind of uh, tea for two could be organized between you and me in university and academia in, uh, in business. Uh, this is more, it's, it's reducing the scope of your broad question. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of things are possibly the, the reason of being not satisfied today is that this interaction in the last decades, in the last hundreds of years even, was built around using the student as the link, not the educator of the student. The student is the one who, do, who does the internship, the, the, who does the immersive exchange with the other side. That's fine for the student, uh, but each, with, this, with, with each student, this has to be real. There is no what we call uh, capitalization of what is happening. So the question again is uh, if there is some uh, model I am really uh, to like, is the model of the continuing education of the educator? Uh, and, uh, just a little anecdote on my side, when, when I, I do employ uh, several interns and uh, uh, apprentices from many places in the world. The condition each time for hiring them for six to six months to three years in a sandwich program is the teacher must come. Not permanently, but uh, visit once, twice, three times during the semester. And work one day with the student on the student's issues. To measure what kind of uh, real life challenges students are facing when they are immersed in their professional context. But also to bring back uh, not just a, a written sentence, but an experience of what is needed in terms of the skills in the students. So the fusion can go through, keep going through the students if, and this works in some places, I have been successful in doing that, if the, the educators play that game of being with the students for one day from time to time during the internships and apprenticeships. There are other ways we have the time. Thank you. We are very out of time, but perhaps we have, uh, because this lady has the microphone since uh, 15 minutes ago. <laughs> Yes, the last question. Yeah, okay. very um, yeah, my name is Lisa Markert. I'm from uh, University of Applied Science in Gießen. And uh, I'm quite happy that we not, did not change our curriculum every year. I'm very happy that we are doing it. There's a lot of improvement possible, but I don't want to change it every year. <laughs> um, and I um, have had the experience that the industries six years ago that told us in Germany, we don't need any engineer. And I think it's around the world, so it was the economic uh, drop down. And so the industry told us we don't need any engineers. And that become that a lot of students decided don't go into engineering anymore because a lot of uncles and mothers and that they were dismissed in the industry. So how can you avoid <laughs> that will happen again? So the industry decided, oh now at that moment I don't want any engineering. And the, the university said, oh, sorry, please come, nevertheless, we have something to, for you, for some, some education. But the industry said, no, we don't want anymore. And then it changed again. So how can you avoid 
that it happens again, that the industry says, no, we don't want. I'm, I'm pleased that we work together, so, but I think my... Uh, May, no, no, I think in America you have had the same, in, in Brazil the same, so it's not, uh, not a German phenomenon, but, but I think we should work together in a way that we have, um, not only, we are driven by, by money from the society, so there must be some society issue and again, but um, I'm really pleased about this working together, and Annette, I think it's, it's we that we can build up a new system, but that's what I say as well, but... Uh, to s I, I'm not happy to, to see that the world's growing on and there's no society issues and I think industry has other yeah, intentions than the university has. It's not only to produce uh, engineers for the industry but also for the society. That's, that's what I want to say, but how could you avoid this yeah, demands? <laughs> I think can, crisis can help us to this situation. Really. Crisis is one of the <laughs> can can not help. No? But it's true. Uh, Sometimes at these situations, and this is why what happens because what happens like in other process of the society, when we are focused on on the soft time, we can you have this type of situation. I need to yeah. governments, company, society. Sometimes. We look at short time objectives and you put this decision that is very, very, very bad. No? Uh, but the question is in the companies, in the street, in the university, in all the, the, the factors have the no capacity to look at long term. Because when you look at long term, don't have this situation. No? But if you are only thinking in the results of the company for this year, for instance, in this situation, you adapt decisions like that. You stop engineering, you stop recruiting people, to reduce. And sometimes, some companies, I think, the environment of the company can help to do that. No? But the question, the key point is to have enough capacity and enough conditions to uh, adapt to long-term decision because training, developing people, in engineering, etc., are all activities long, long-term activities. We will not must to stop, accelerate it, depending of each year. No, it's not easy to do that, and it's happened. But I think uh, it's the guilty of that. I don't know. Maybe. Thank you. I, I, I need to answer this one because uh, there is a big distance between uh, uh, industry saying uh, we will not hire engi additional engineers this coming year, two years, whatever. It was caused by something uh, that was much bigger than industry that was this crisis. And uh, industry telling you we don't need any more engineers in the way you report it. It's, this is an exaggeration. Okay. Number two, uh, during that time, there were charters flights organized from Spain and Portugal to Germany for hiring in masses engineers from these countries because never, even if there was a, 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 down, a, a short time down in the recruitment, the long-term wave in Germany is a lack of engineers because of because of the demographic situation of the country. So uh, you should dissonate between the short term and the long term. And the long term it is uh, it's not uh, two years. It, well, it's not no sorry. It's not twenty years. It's, it's two three years. The crisis was not that long because the charters kept flying. Uh, and uh, number three, uh, it's also an exaggeration to say, to say that changing the curriculum every year means changing all of the curriculum every year. It was not what I was saying. The readiness to change, the readiness to take risk, is something that academia must learn as well. Yes, I, I agree.
have finished our session. Thank you very much, all of you, for the participation, and also Javier, Alex, and Miguel for the presentation. And, and, and I guess yeah. we will all be around, so if you want to have a chat about something, you just reach us during the breaks. Sorry, last question. Is any doubt we need engineers? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Used to the call that we come back at two o'clock here. Okay? Enjoy your meal.